All right. We're going to continue our uh, two chapters a week. But as I said, all the prior weeks, you are able to jump ahead if you'd like. Uh, there is no real uh, speed at which you need to go. As long as you complete everything before the end of the 16 weeks, you are fine. So today we're going to uh, cover chapter seven and eight. Virtual machine management is the first of two. We have passed the halfway point, working our way towards chapter 12 and the end of uh, the first of two things that we're going to do. Uh, this has been all the ICM. And then after that, it'll be the uh, optimize and scale. This is going to deal a little, uh, it'll stay within the realm of virtual machines and what we can do with them. First and foremost, templates are awesome because we don't have to recreate a VM every single time. We can build templates that we can spin up VMs from. Because you know, installing an operating system takes at least 20 minutes and at most 40 minutes because it's Windows. But if we don't want to sit there, and reinstall an operating system every time, we could install it once, turn it into a template, and then just deploy the template afterwards, saving us a whole lot of time. There are a number of ways that you can make a template. For example, you can uh, go under clone. You take a virtual machine that's turned off and you can either clone it into a template or uh, there is a template option to turn it into that. You can also export it as an OVF and then import it later. Uh, deploying VMs from a template is pretty easy. And you select, uh, you go to where you have your virtual machine templates and use it here. This example, we have two. So they're selecting the Windows 10 one and they're going to create a VM off of that. If you need to make updates, to your template because you know operating systems need updates. Well, you can update your templates when that when that time comes. So if you need to install a new program, if you need to do patch updates or any configuration changes or drivers, whatever, you can convert the template back into a virtual machine, make whatever changes you want, and reconvert it back to a template. You can also clone VMs. There'll be exact copy of the original. Uh, it can be on or off if you need to clone a VM. That can happen when, when the virtual machine is either on or off. Instant clones resume from the exact same place as the source. If in order to use these things, you have to have a system that has the exact same setup. So for example, uh, any if you're using a VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure, where your users have to log in to a website and then from there get access to a virtual machine where they could work, that's where uh, this kind of cloning would work. If we need to rapidly scale out quickly, that's where instant clones can also come in along with uh, testing and DevOps. Removing a VM is pretty simple. You can just unregister it, which means it will still stay in the disk to bring back later. If you delete from this, then it's all permanently gone. Content libraries are basically places where you're going to put your templates, your ISO files, and all of that. And you can share them across vCenter systems online. So that could be something like this, where you're working globally. Items in those, uh, in these libraries will, can be accessed anywhere. And this is where you would go. You'd uh, 
take a template, for example, and we want to put that up into our library to be accessible everywhere else. So we're going to clone to our library and say which library it's going to go to. From there, you can deploy out uh, you know, VMs from those. You can also mount any ISO files directly from a content library. So some benefits that you have for using these is you have, you can share. So everything doesn't have to be in one place. It'll be consistent across all your vSphere instances. Uh, it's more efficient in storage because we're not, again, we're not staying to one system. We're being, we're able to share out and uh, they are secure. It's not just unencrypted storage for the world. You have different kinds of libraries that you could use. Uh, local, anything that you can control. Uh, the published that are available for subscription and subscribe that'll sync any published library. So published would be great if you have a couple of vCenters uh, or vSphere's across the world and you wanna keep them all synchronized so all the others can subscribe to one library that you publish and you know that they'll all stay up to date. Modifying VMs, because they're VMs, they're pretty easy to uh, make modifications to them. It's not like you have to take a VM apart and install another stick of RAM. You can add virtual hardware in the edit settings. Some of the items can be added while the VM is running, uh, but some cannot. Uh, Again, some of the hardware can also be removed while the system is on, but ideally it's best to uh, add remove hardware when the system's off, the virtual machine is off. Here you can also control things like how many CPU cores and how much memory is being used or can be used by the VM. There are a list of the hot pluggable devices these are ones that can be added or removed while the system is on. If you needed to create a RDM file, a raw device mapping to get a virtual machine directly connected to a physical LUN, you can do that by adding a RDM disk. in case you need to uh, make that kind of connection. You can also increase the size of virtual disks. As long as that VM's disk doesn't have any snapshots, you are able to expand the disk. You can't go back down. You can increase, you can't necessarily decrease. Once you do that, then you'll need to uh, run tools within the, the virtual machines operating system to take uh, to use that space. So for example, here, uh, it looks like the disk had two gigabytes and then we added 18. Well, we can't, the Windows doesn't just automatically use it. It stands as unallocated. You have to use something like disk management to take advantage of the whole space. If you have thin provision disks, you can inflate them. So instead of only using what it needs, you can inflate it to be the full size that uh, you said. Your VM options really come from that VMX file. So you kind of see things like the guest operating system, uh, the guest type, uh, where it's saved, that kind of stuff. VM tools, something you should have installed. It'll make running the VM much smoother. You can choose to check and upgrade tools if there is an upgrade automatically, or you do it manually, along with any custom options for the buttons. 
Uh, if this VM needs to be turned on as soon as the physical system is on, because let's say it's a domain controller or a DNS server or any, you know, anything important, you can have it boot immediately after the, the hypervisor turns on or after a couple, uh, after a delay. You can also set what to do in case it fails to boot. And if you need to get into the BIOS, you know, because getting into the BIOS of virtual machines is pretty hard. The BIOS moves really fast in a VM. So you could uh, check this to go straight to the BIOS setup. Migrating VMs is something important, especially if we want to uh, use VMs for critical infrastructure that can't just uh, can't stay off. For example, our routers, our firewalls, our DNS servers, our DHCP servers, things that we need on all the time. You need to be able to migrate them on the fly. Migration means moving a VM from either a host, a data store, a vCenter server to another. You can do it in, in a number of ways could do it when the virtual machine is powered off. You could do it when it's suspended. If you have vMotion, you can move it while it's on. If you have storage vMotion, you can move the VM while it's on to another data store. And the shared nothing vSphere motion uh, can do both moving the storage and itself while it's on. Pretty neat. The great for um, the great to, uh, to keep it on no matter what. Here are your different types and some of the pros and cons of each. A V motion migration happens when the virtual machine is on and it moves from one system, one host system to another host system. So just in case we are running our firewall off of ESXi and the physical box needs to do some work like maintenance, firmware updates, uh, any physical changes, we can migrate the VM over and life can continue without affecting. As long as the two systems can talk to one another and they have shared storage, so both uh, systems can access the same storage infrastructure, whether that's VMFS or NFS, uh, whatever it is, a SAN, as long as they can talk to one another, then we can, and we have the same uh, networks in both sides, then we can move a VM from one host to another. Here are some of the requirements. So it, a virtual machine should not have an active connection to a internal virtual switch. So uh, if you wanna use a distributed switch should not have affinity, CPU affinity configured. Uh, shouldn't have connection to a virtual device like a CD, DVD, floppy, or any local image. It should be more uh, free to, to go anywhere. If the swap is not accessible, that might be a problem. And again, if you're using, if your virtual machine that you want to migrate is in any way connected to the physical the physicality of its host, it's not really going to be able to migrate from one system to another. It has to really be independent of where it's at. The hosts, again, should be able to communicate with whatever storage system we have. Uh, per VMFS or NFS, you can do up to 128 concurrent migrations you should have at least a gigabit ethernet network. So you really wanna use 
uh, something much more high speed like 10 gigabit or fiber in order to quickly move virtual machines. Because again, the virtual machines are not necessarily small, uh, especially Windows systems that are a critical infrastructure or file servers that are critical infrastructure. Those could be you know, half a terabyte big and loaded with all kinds of services and stuff running that needs to stay on. So you really want to have a very strong backbone. You should also have compatible CPUs, which really means um, if you're creating a, Dennis, a data center, then all your, your servers in your data center should just be identical. Here are some CPU characteristics. So things like clock speeds, cache sizes, hyperthreading, number of cores, that is not necessarily a requirement because those are virtualized by the VM kernel. Uh, the manufacturer, whether Intel or AMD, uh, and the generation may matter because those contain small differences that could crash the virtual machine. Um, if you're using uh, some multimedia stuff, again, and one processor has some options and some don't, that might actually crash the system. Um, any, if you're doing like nested virtualization, that could be a, a problem if your destination doesn't handle virtualization hardware assist. There are a few other settings like EVC. It's a cluster feature uh, that will help you in case of any incompatible CPUs. It's a, it's a good check for yourself. EVC works at the cluster level. Using all the CPUs, uh, uh, it turns them into a baseline. So it knows what, uh, which host can handle what. Again, in order to use something like EVC, you're going to need to ensure that your CPUs all come from a single vendor and are of a certain age and up, that they all can handle virtualization, that they have things like the execution disable on, that the systems are configured for vMotion, and the virtual machines inside are uh, compatible with the infrastructure that's running on them. Again, this is not a problem if your data center has the exact same system. All of this you can just ignore because if it works on one, it'll work on them all. Virtual machine EVC can be added uh, to any or all the virtual machines in the cluster. So we can be a little more granular in our EVC for specific virtual machines is maybe they run a, a certain OS or they're configured a certain way. There are ways to change the CPU features to either be available or unavailable to a, uh, to a VM as needed. Again, this is more uh, on a case by case basis when it comes to what you have running in a virtual machine and what OS and what applications are running within it. You always want to know uh, what errors are happening. And actually, we have a section on alarms that we'll go through today. Uh, VMware does a job of checking to see, does the destination, can it handle this VM in this example? Uh, it looks like the, the virtual machine that we want to move from one host to another, uh, it doesn't have a CD DVD drive that again, that this ID is specific to this first host. That's why it's not accessible in the second host because duh, it's physical, it doesn't exist in the second host.
when you use vMotion, we're moving uh, the, the VM itself. And if, especially if we're moving uh, via storage, we're moving the files from one to another. So again, you want to make sure you have a strong backbone because that's going to be a lot of data moving around. Here's kind of a, a picture of the process of storage vMotion. We have this application that's running in the VM. And we want to move it from one data store to another. Well, it's not just going to be a copy paste. Uh, the VM kernel takes a part in, in moving this virtual machine, especially if it's on. It'll uh, do a mirror input output to copy those files over. And then the VM will be accessible from the second uh, data store while everything continues to copy. Because this is intensive on the drives and on the network, you want to plan out migrations. Obviously, if an emergency happens, you know, uh, then that takes priority. But if we're, uh, you know, if, if we're planning this out on a non-emergency basis, then you want to plan out when you're going to do it, especially moving VMs in off-peak hours, and so that nobody feels the uh, the network drag as the copies happen. Shared nothing, vSphere vMotion, allows virtual machines to change from one host to another, even if the two don't have shared storage. Just in case you have different systems in your data center. We can do cross vCenter migrations, because up to this point, we've mentioned all these types of migrations with one vCenter in command. It is possible to link the two together, two different vCenters together, and move virtual machines from one to another, as long as they're about the same version of each other, that they have in link, enhanced link mode on, that their time is synchronized, then we can move a virtual machine off of one vCenter off to another. VM kernel is pretty powerful. It, uh, it is the, the kernel that runs all these operations. You really want to make sure that any communication to VM kernel uh, is separated from everything else. Your vMotion TCP IP stack, it looks like this. In the user world, it has its uh, usual things of the memory heap, the ARP table, the, the routing table, the default gateway. vMotion has its own for the uh, for live migrations that we've been talking about. Again, the the whole idea of vCenter and the virtual machines is a big one. It's not really a setup for a small business. We're talking worldwide. It is possible to set this up in a way where a virtual machine will, uh, as they call it, follow the sun. So as the day moves, and I just realized the arrow in this picture is completely backwards if uh, we're following the sun. Uh, so let's ignore the way that that arrow is pointing, but you get the point of as the as the day moves around the Earth, a, a virtual machine could migrate from one 
data center to the next data center to the next data center, staying up to date and available all around the globe. This is great for things like multi-site balancing, great for disaster avoidance. We'll, we will ensure that our system is on no matter what, because if it's not on ours, it'll be on another data center. Of course, for this kind of things, you need a strong backbone. You want a very quick round trip time between your, uh, your data centers. You'll see some network checks between vCenter instances, like any MAC address incompatibility, uh, moving from a distributed to a standard switch. You really don't want to do that. You want to keep it on distributed switches. Any internal network you really don't want to use. You want to use more distributed switches for this level of migrations. It is possible, if you uh, did not know, it is possible to encrypt the data that we're moving, and we really should. Because especially if we're talking about critical infrastructure, let's say we're doing a follow the sun setup for our DNS server. Well, we really don't want somebody to intercept that traffic and be able to somehow manipulate that and, and add records that they shouldn't uh, and really harm us on a global scale. Snapshots, uh, the, the quick about this is use snapshots. They are wonderful. They don't take a lot of time and they save you when you get in trouble. So a snapshot preserves the state of the virtual machine as it is at the moment you took that snapshot. Just like when you take a picture, it's a, a point in time point in time reference that you can always go back to should something go bad. Great for testing. Great for learning. Because if you mess up the operating system, if you mess up the application, you know, if things go south, you just shrug it off and go back to that snapshot and life resumes again. Snapshots can be done when the system is on, off, or suspended. It'll take note of the configuration, of the memory state, of the disks. Um, it does not include any independent virtual disks or any physical disks. It's all within the realm of the virtual machine. You have a couple of different types of snapshots. So you have the VMFS sparse, the SE sparse, and the vSAN. and you see their block size for each. Your snapshot will consist of a couple of files. So you'll see uh, stuff like this. The MSN, the configuration state. If, we, uh, if the system is on, we'll do a memory state. We have the disk descriptor and then uh, disks that follow that. And the VMSD stores all the descriptions and relationships of all the snapshots in place. The VMSD, what is in the VMSD, I'll show you in just a bit. The VMSD keeps track of the, the snapshot. So for example, uh, there is a, a picture like this. I thought there was a better picture. Yeah, you can use something like this. Uh, the VMSD will say, hey, uh, here is the main. I see a snapshot for 1.0 and a snapshot for uh, 1.2. It'll keep in order what files belong to which snapshot, all of these. It will put it in order. So we, we don't have to manage the files individually. VMware already does that for us. You can delete virtual machine snapshots 
if especially if we want to clean up some disk space, it is possible to do that. Any if you deleted this snap zero two, any uh, changes that are the latest will get rolled into the one above it. And then this will be deleted. If you so happen to make a break between, then uh, it's not possible to return to that state because the data will be deleted and the chain will be broken. It is, again, possible to remove all snapshots if needed. And then all the changes from base to the latest will all get rolled up into the one. So that's, that's basically the consolidation when we take our snapshots and we bring them down to one or we remove them all and uh, put it all on the main drive. VMware is pretty good about letting you know when it's time to take some actions. It'll give you those issues and trigger any alarms as necessary. To consolidate, they've made it easy. Just go to snapshots and you'll have the option to consolidate. You can also specify within the configuration parameters uh, the maximum amount of snapshots that can be used for a specific VM. Cool. Any questions? Okay. Oops. 